есть кола года. There is the wheel of the year. Here it is in front of you. The wheel of the year consists of eight sacred festivities, eight marker points that accompany us in our life and do something to our world, our consciousness, our destiny and our life. When we are not aware of it, it doesn't mean that it won't influence us. But when we are aware, then it means that we ourselves can affect these processes by right and we can do so as a full-fledged participant. The eight marker points are connected, of course, to the four main natural elements that are the masters of our environment in our world, specifically on the territory of Europe, the territory of Eurasia, as well as all of the Northern Hemisphere in general. We are working here with four main elements that you obviously are perfectly familiar with. These are earth, fire, water and air. The four elements are represented twice within a year. Once during the awakening of the element and another time during the waning of the element. This way, the eight sacred dates, eight sacred festivities are formed, which, first of all, sway our reality, thereby constantly aligning it with all other realities, serving as a gyroscope, so to say, that does not allow the sacred principle of equilibrium to be interrupted. And on the other hand, these eight points are moments of attunement between the human consciousness and the consciousness of reality. Let us talk about the wheel of the year in general. Let us remind ourselves once again about the importance of understanding and feeling these festivities. Of course, these are our festivities, pagan festivities. They are not tied to some historical dates of some historical or non-historical events. They are not something artificial, they are truly natural. The reality we live in is born on these vibrations, and so are we. Neglecting this knowledge will have a negative impact on our life, our fate, health, of course, as well as our well-being. We are working on our consciousness, persistently and extensively working on our consciousness in order, of course, not to allow such foolishness any longer. What is natural is natural. What is natural should be. Our ancestors knew this and now so do we. Air which awakened at Imbolc slowly transitions into today's festivity, Ostara, the period of the awakening of water. You know that the union of water and air creates the current of time and will be consequently revealing one more level of our consciousness, the causal body revealing it in a pure volume and rhythmically tuning, aligning it with the general currents of time and life. Not tuning it to the unnatural time, not to the artificial time, but to the most genuine one. What is this needed for, I will tell you a bit later. Next comes the awakening of Earth. This happens on Beltane. And then awakens fire. This happens on the Leto festivity. This way, the first half of the year, if we count from the common calendar New Year, we see that the elements awaken during the first half of the year. And that their waning begins after Litho. The first to wane is the one that was first to awaken, air. Air awoke at Imbolc, and at Lugnasad, or Lamas, as it is also called, it wanes. And so all of the elements start slowly moving towards a decline. In September, on the 21st of September, during the autumn equinox, water will be waning, similarly as it is awakening now. Earth will be waning on the day of Samhain, which is also known in our current secular tradition as Halloween, thereby balancing out its own awakening, which happened six months prior at Beltane. And on Eula, the day of the winter solstice, happens the waning of the element that woke up the last, fire. 
And so from Yule until the next Simborg, there are 40 days of the dark period, 40 days without time, which we also utilize in our magic work. Each period between the festivities, just as the holiday itself, are of course used for magic work. What should they be used for otherwise? But let me remind you that magical work is not exactly sorcery. While the common sorcery can be used to achieve one's own personal interests, disregarding how it will influence the surrounding reality, magical work cannot allow itself such liberties. All is tied with everything, and the magical consciousness knows this perfectly well. No action is taken without its prior fitting to the future reality, without an examination whether it is appropriate, as well as where it is appropriate, why it is appropriate, and when it is appropriate. All can be combined, always, personal interests and the interests of reality, the interests of the universe. You just need to know the laws according to which our world develops and take them correctly into account. That is, if the most important rules are not being infringed upon, and we are not talking about societal rules, such as the ones they wrote on paper according to some interests of certain groups, but the rules that are tied to the principle of life, tied to the principle of development and the existence, always, being that what is dictated to us by nature, that what the entire magical reality tells us about itself. And if all of our actions work in harmony with these intentions, then everything turns out well. This does not deprive of freedom, on the contrary, it gives a great amount of freedom because no one is being harmed by that action. And it is probably very important not only to understand, but also to see that your action doesn't harm anybody. The festivities we follow in our work, as well as the mysteries we carry out at those times, surely do aim to respect this principle, to respect this rule of alignment, harmonization and non-contradiction. It might sound a bit hackneyed to say, do no harm, but humans can really do harm especially when there are a lot of them, especially when they act without thinking, especially when they are shackled by fears. Since today is the awakening of water, Ostara is awakening, the element of water is awakening, which relates to chaos and thus naturally to emotions, and so to the astral body, the word fear has not been mentioned in vain, because it is precisely the water element that can birth a fear as well as help getting rid of it. And we not only need to understand this mechanism, the way it works, in order to be aware of it and use it and work with it appropriately in the future, but also to accomplish a very important task. Getting rid of the fears that are of no use to our consciousness. Because some fears are needed. They can serve as a kind of immunity, a very important part of the organism. But there are also unnecessary fears that are superfluous and redundant, similar to viruses that your immunity can't handle yet. If we do everything the right way, if we enter the awakening of water correctly, then this process of freeing ourselves from superfluous fears will take place absolutely naturally and automatically. And here lays the mighty power of the elemental force that acts the way it does because such is its nature. And it doesn't need to be invoked, conjured or bewitched it is simply there, it is its natural form of manifestation. So, these are the eight marker points which we will be carrying our consciousness through successively. Ostara, what is that? During our last lecture we also spoke about the fact that the Wheel of the Year, the eight-point star of the Wheel of the Year, 
has in a surprising way situated itself between two cultures, the Celtic and the Slavic, two so seemingly different and warring civilizations and traditions and warring folks as a consequence, turn out to be as close as relatives, karmically tied by one united magical work, because Slavs and Celts are engaged in making these eight marker points sway, thereby turning the wheel of the year and the fact of synchronizing all of Europe's civilizational environment with the correct processes. During the times when they forget to do this, things turn out very badly. And on the contrary, when they do as they are supposed to and don't forget, things turn out very, very well. If at the present there wouldn't be such a difficult conflict, and you surely understand that this conflict is artificially and purposely made, then the development of our cultures the development of the Celtic and Slavic traditions would transpire much more harmoniously and would much more strongly manifest itself on the territories overseen by them as well as within the informational and power currents that they are in charge of. But to the greatest regret, in these last 2,000 years, we all have been through a period of trial, a time of problems that, as you understand, has not been in vain. From a certain point of view, it has been a provocation. A provocation by sin, a provocation by serfdom, a provocation by the right of doing nothing, the right of not taking responsibility for one's actions, for one's treachery, for one's incapacity to withstand hardship. That time is over, but it doesn't mean that all trials are done with. Now everything must be restored anew, which is what we are doing. Let's get back to the Wheel of the Year. The facilities that aren't at fixed dates, and these are always tied to the astronomical days of equinox and solstice, are entrusted to the Slavic folk, the Slavic culture to be in charge of. These festivities have a moving date and are not fixed to a calendar day. Whereas festivities that fall under the operation and authority of the Celtic culture are nailed to the calendar. These are very much fixed festivities. They are Imbolc, Beltane, Lugnasat and Samhain respectively. And the other four festivities are the Slavic ones, Ostara, Kupala, Lido, Mabon and Yule respectively. Traditionally we call them the Celtic way just because the Celtic culture has preserved them to a greater degree. Not only the names of these festivities, not only their cultural manifestation, but also the description of rituals, as well as fully preserved ceremonial stories that haven't been erased. The Slavs have had it pretty rough. Their informational space has been cleaned out way more brutally than it has been done with the Celts, and in a much harder way. This is why on the Slavic side all of it is veiled up and, I don't want to say forgotten, but slightly erased from the informational space, although it is not really gone. And Ostara, which is in fact belonging to the Slavic tradition, is more manifested as a working tool, or rather as a work assignment, in the Slavic cultural environment. Even though it is slightly forgotten within the secular as well as the Christian lifestyles. The Slavs would call this festivity Javoronki or Komojedica. Later, the Christian label Maslenica stuck to it, but this is a typical methodology used by the newcomer religion to seize these ritual points. We will talk about this later on. 
Nonetheless, it hasn't gone from the Slavic culture. It is just that it underwent a full distortion of the meaning of its originally implied ceremonial parts. What I mean is that if the pagan meaning of an action was a certain one, then Christianity took it and turned it inside out and upside down, thereby insulting the gods instead of praising them. And although a simple and primitive human mind could have not even suspected that, Nonetheless, an intention is not an action, but an action is already an offense, even if you're acting without intent. It still remains an offense. And what we are doing here is certainly not only expanding our consciousness, but in a certain way attempting to straighten out the wrongful actions and removing them out of the general informational space. The wrongful actions and, as you understand, absolutely unjust offenses inflicted upon nature and the gods. I want to remind you, as we regularly say this during our lectures, that when we speak of gods, we aren't speaking of humans. And although we tend to personify them by habit, we never, even for a second, forget that we are dealing with universal consciousnesses. And when we say he, it doesn't mean that he is a male, and that when we say she, it doesn't mean that it is something feminine. There are masculine functions and feminine functions, but no masculine or feminine personification. Just keep this in mind, so that not to make the gods primitive, and not to make these consciousnesses primitive by comparing them to ourselves, and creating parallels through this personification. As, if I can do this, then he can also do this, if I cannot do this, then she cannot either. It is wrong at its root and causes terrible distortion. When we put the wrong accents in the system, in one's own personal system of the worldly structure, it ruins our worldview. And this naturally leads to wrongful actions, because it wouldn't be scary to offend something primitive, it isn't a crime to offend something primitive. No, no. Primitive, sure, it may be, but it is only so through the prism of a consciousness.